If you've seen my other videos covering Beetlejuice and Wesley Willis, and maybe my live streams, then you've probably gathered that I'm a fan of The Howard Stern Show. I've been listening to it for a long time, and a good chunk of my YouTube recommendations are Stern Show clips. Now sure, there are people that have been listening to the show for a lot longer than I have and most definitely know more than I do, but I think making stuff like this is a good way to stretch my creative legs, something that today's topic has struggled with in more than one way. Plus, I think this is a good excuse to share my favorite Stern Show caller with an audience that may have never known his majestic voice. Eric Sean Lynch, better known as Eric the Midget or Eric the Actor by his many adoring fans, was born on March 11, 1975. Eric was not like most children. He had an incredibly small stature. His height in adulthood was somewhere around 3 foot 5 inches, which is within the dwarfism threshold. Despite that, he hated being lumped in with other people that are similar to him unless certain terms were used. Unfortunately, most people wouldn't treat Eric with respect, or at least that's what he claimed, but we'll see how he gave it back to them later. He was also born with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is a group of tissue disorders that affect the skin, bones, vessels, and other soft tissues. This ailment made his fingers into a twisted, knotted mess. To keep piling things on, he had a pretty noticeable marking on his face. On his forehead rested a large birthmark, a brightly colored blotch. It was Nevis Flamius Nuki if you want to get technical, or a stork bite, but I think that term suits him better. This marking was often used as a way to make fun of his appearance, as the birthmark appeared to increase in saturation when he was angry, making his forehead light up with a pleasant fluorescent pink. On top of these things, Eric was bound to a wheelchair due to his short legs, his faulty joints, and the fact that he had a club foot. Though when referring to this, he'd exclaimed that he was club fucking footed. Unfortunately, most of Eric's upbringing and childhood is shrouded in mystery because Eric was very selective with what information he would share, especially on the radio waves. Speaking of, we should probably talk about why he's significant, right? On September 19, 2002, Howard Stern and Robin Quivers were exchanging their usual banter for thousands of highly intelligent, astute, and profound listeners. That's not sarcasm, I promise. This was a simpler time, where simply talking into a microphone for a radio show was enough to thrust you into stardom. Good luck pulling that off these days without the internet. Stern received a call and decided to let it through to the show. Little did Howard know that he was about to talk to one of the most significant callers and eventual guests he would ever have. Hi. I'm calling because a couple of weeks ago you um, referred to Kelly Clark and as an unattractive, ugly white girl. Well, I don't think so. Eric called in to talk about American Idol because it was popular at the time, and we'd soon learn that historically Eric has always enjoyed terrible things. Howard had previously made a comment about Kelly Clarkson, one of the show's contestants at the time, calling her unattractive in his opinion. Eric didn't like that comment at all. He called in to make a valiant effort to defend Kelly. Howard said that while Kelly was definitely fit to win the competition because of her voice, visually she did nothing for him. He had complained about her outfit and her hair and other superficial things that were all relatively meaningless. Eric, on the other hand, was enamored by her and saw absolutely no flaws in her in any capacity. His entire defense was just saying that he disagrees, attempting to argue a point to a non-existent problem. During this call, Eric also confessed to living off of SSI due to his medical conditions. It's understandable that he would have to do so, but giving ammunition to people who regularly laugh at the expense of other people probably wasn't a smart move. Eric was just 27 years young at the time, and he made the fullest decision of telling Howard and his many active listeners that he was yet to dip his dick in any mucus hatch. Howard saw this as the reason why Eric was so head over heels for Kelly, saying that once Eric finally got some stank on his hang low, he'd be over her immediately. Eric's virginity would be a major point of contention for him going forward. Howard was very curious and inquired about Eric's masturbation frequency and what exactly he was thinking about when he was pulling his meat. Eric, however, was a shy boy and didn't want to fess up to the terrible things that were bouncing around behind that birthmark on his forehead. With a little work, or rather prying, Howard got Eric to admit that he saved photos of Kelly Clarkson onto his computer from various fan websites, but he was still respectful, whatever the hell that means. There is no way that guy was so into some famous woman and never once thought about what her butt crack smells like, I'll tell you that right now. After some healthy male-to-male -male needling with Stern, Eric compiled a list of whack material for the show, illustrating his taste in women. Unfortunately, he couldn't even list five women that he's tugged his tallywhacker to, mentioning only Beverly Mitchell and Britney Spears. Give me your top three whack, whack material. Oh, let's see. Well, one off seven, heaven, Beverly Mitchell. Beverly Mitchell from Seventh Heaven. That's the top girl to whack it to? Well, one of them. No little people? No. What about Gary Coleman? Oh, please. No, don't go that way. 
<laughs> this call mainly served to embarrass Eric because he had just made the mistake of calling into the show and revealing things about himself, but it wasn't all for nothing either. This was just the beginning of his legacy for radio. To top it all off, he got 500 bucks just for calling in, which is pretty cool. I'm sure he spent the money very wisely. One week later, Eric mustered up the courage to call in once again to continue his crusade for women that are incredibly out of his league and would never even look in his direction, which is, well, down, I guess. Either way, Howard being the cynical type that he is, tried to talk Eric down from that mindset, as perhaps Eric was subconsciously setting himself up for failure. The main takeaway from this call is that Eric should just go to burn centers to pick up women because they probably have low standards due to their recent change of appearance. At least that's what Howard tried to tell him. Eric ultimately didn't take this advice, but he did wheel away with another 500 bucks. I'm starting to wonder how that worked out with his SSI. Eric stood out among many regular callers for a variety of reasons. There was the obvious part of him being a little person with a massive ego, but it was also because he was brutally boring. Listening to him sometimes felt like you were stuck at a funeral and you just couldn't get away. He could bring the whole show to a screeching halt just because he was so goddamn uninteresting to listen to, but that in and of itself was part of the humor. His delivery and his delusional takes were so out there that the host just had to laugh at his expense, and then everything would just go back to normal. Hell, the fact he was such a bore was one of the many reasons Howard would leave him on hold for a majority of each episode, if not for the complete entirety of many. This angered Eric, as he thought he had a lot to say, but it just never came out coherent or fast enough. But this didn't matter because typically he would just drop a bunch of meaningless anecdotes, wasting valuable airtime and turning listeners off of the show. Ignoring his advances also guaranteed a more entertaining response if and when they eventually took his call. All right, Eric the Midget, you're on the air. Okay, finally. Oh, God. Oh, boy. I'm going to explain it to you one last hey, time. You buddy. little shithead. Eric, the show isn't about you. I try to get yeah, to you when I can. I... The little guy had a fragile ego and a short fuse. The word short just kind of followed him around, I guess. Alongside being a snoozer, he had a pretty distinctive voice and delivery. He always sounded like he was struggling to talk, as his voice and tone were shaky and crunched. He sort of sounded like he was trapped under a heavy object. That, coupled with his spaced-out speech patterns, made his calls quite the unusual listen. Among his many speech patterns, there was a particular one that people found very entertaining. He would sometimes choke up while saying words and had to repeat himself, or he'd stutter a little bit. This led to him making an ack-ack sound, which was used against him via the utility of sound bites. A few seconds of Martian jibber-jabber were lifted from the movie Mars Attacks, where a Martian says ack 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 sounds, and it was played anytime Eric would call in and start fumbling his words or running his mouth. This bullying would manifest and put a significant damper on his relationship with the show. He was an avid listener, as indicated by his early calls where he admitted to listening to the broadcast at 5 in the morning due to the show's schedule and time zone issues, but that is quite the early time just to rise and listen to the radio. However, as he began interacting with Stern and his staffers, he began to show, a uh, disdain for people. This seemed to stem from people constantly goofing on him for his behavior and presentation. For example, when Stern would put Eric on hold, he'd respond by getting defensive and suggesting that Stern owed him airtime for how long he was waiting. He might have had some kind of argument if he had, I don't know, something actually interesting to say when he was on the hot seat. Anyway, during these calls, he would frequently act callous and rude, which of course would be recorded and archived for soundbite use in prank calls or to mess with him directly. These tactics against him would often push him to declare that he would never return to the show. Despite how many times he said he was never coming back, he always would. He just couldn't stay away because the show was arguably the biggest thing going on in his life. Without it, he just wouldn't have anything else going on. Well, that and simping for women that are ridiculously out of his reach, but we've got a bit more before we can really dwell on that. Even though he was a rude little shit a majority of the time, he always felt entitled to have his hand out, twisted fingers stretched out as far as possible. He would rarely return favors or even be kind as a gesture unless he specifically wanted something out of somebody. But even then, what could he really do for anybody besides bore them to death? You might be noticing a pattern here, how he was rude to people but wanted more out of them. The thing he wanted most out of the show, outside of satiating his personal and sexual desires, was airtime. He wanted attention. He wanted some kind of relevance. He would call Gary Delabate, the producer of The Stern Show, demanding that he get airtime. Gary often pushed for Eric to be ignored because he thought Eric was boring and stupid, among other things like being a mooch. Howard and Gary often wanted Eric to repay their favors by doing entertaining things for the show, but Eric would rarely follow through with these things, and this really lowered Gary's expectation of our favorite dwarf. And Gary's opinion really bothered Eric. This led to Eric leaving a nasty voicemail for Gary, where he threatened an all-out war, suggesting that he was going to use litigation to take money away from Baba Booey and Stern. 
Hey, asshole, eight face. You want a fucking war with me? You got a fucking war with me. Trust me, asshole. You're gonna fucking lose. I'm going to make you fucking pay for all the retarded bullshit that you've been saying about me on the air. Shut those gigantic fucking cock sucking lips up. You sissy bolt rolling asshole. Better stop saying the bullshit that you're saying about me or trust me, your kids aren't going to have a fucking college fund to survive on. Fuck you. But despite how often Eric worked against the wishes of Howard, he did unwittingly create Radio Gold multiple times. For example, in 2007, when American Idol was the biggest thing in the U.S., Eric was expected Lee Glue to the show. He knew everything about every single contestant, caught every single show, had opinions on every performance in every single verdict. Sanjaya Malakar was one of the most popular contestants at the time, known for just how fucking awful his music was, but he somehow just kept getting through every round. Howard had expressed that he loathed Sanjaya's music, and Eric surprisingly agreed, because Sanjaya sucked. A now defunct website Vote for the Worst was frequently shitting all over Sanjaya, talking openly about how his music was terrible and he was a bad candidate for the show. The site was primarily focused on voting for the absolute worst candidates in order to stuff the ballot and alter the outcomes of various televised talent shows, just for the laughs. Stern loved this idea and urged his listeners and viewers to assist in rigging the polls. Eric hated this, just as much as he hated Sanjaya, demanding to know why Howard wanted to ruin the idol by voting Sanjaya in. Howard was going to push his agenda either way, and complaining about it was only going to bolster him. Somehow, some way, Eric just didn't understand how the Stern Show operated despite how much he'd supposedly listened to it over the years. I think, Eric, I want to throw my millions of listeners' support to Sanjaya as well. Why not? Why? <laughs> because I think I want to join. I, I know what you're saying, it'll ruin it, but I think if we... How funny would it be if they crown him the American Idol and Simon I goes berserk? Eric was a rising star among Stern fans. Just like all busy celebrities, Eric was going to need an agent or some kind of manager. Problem here is that he was a bit of a nuisance, so getting someone that would stick with him through thick and thin was going to be a tricky task to say the least. However, a man named Johnny Frado was up to the task. Johnny was the son of someone who was a heavy hitter in the mob and told plenty of stories on air about growing up with a mafioso father. Given the types of people that he was surrounded by, Johnny wasn't phased by much, so Eric's small stature and gargantuan ego was something he was more or less prepared to tackle. You know, given his size and ego, Eric had a lot more in common with a chihuahua than he'd likely ever admit. Anyway, one time, a particular caller really upset Eric. The caller claimed to have gone to school with him when they were younger and said that he made the school accommodate him by installing a ramp. But Eric was a rude, ungrateful little turd who acted entitled and ruined the school with all of the construction. Eric, enraged and engulfed in an inferno of anger, left an emotional voicemail to Johnny with a simple demand. He wanted this guy taken out. He ordered a hit like you or I order coffee in the morning. He knew very little about him. Just his first name, Jerry. Well, that and he wanted him clipped. Moving forward, Eric became increasingly wishy-washy as the show moved into the late 2000s and early 2010s and the staff was getting tired of his shit. With that in mind, they had an ingenious idea to get Eric on the show without having to physically get him there. In theory, creating a dummy of Eric in place of him in the studio would work, and it just made sense. This would lower the amount of stress for anyone that would have to be involved in transporting him, as they wouldn't need to actually deal with his plethora of shit. Plus, the doll wouldn't be able to talk and that'd be the icing on the cake. This wasn't going to be some shoddily thrown together dummy, no. This was a real doll, which is a specially made realistic sex doll. They have soft rubber skin, tight holes, and all of the nooks and crannies you'd probably expect from a semen depositing unit. For an Eric doll, this meant he'd have a functioning, fuckable butthole. Just what the show needed to really push the envelope of what people would pay money to see. Howard and his co-host thought it'd be entertaining to let people have sex with a doll in the studio. Eric, of course, was not a fan of this idea. Fred Norris, an old friend of Howard and a longtime member of the show, proposed the idea of compiling a collection of Eric's favorite hats so they could be swapped out as other guys tagged in to fill Eric's silicone holes with their chunky baby gravy. So, since Eric was understandably livid about the doll's possible creation, he called in and declared that if they made the doll, they'd have some serious legal problems. Howard said he would gladly go to court over this, just because the judge would undoubtedly act confused by having to give judgment over a little person's sex doll fiasco. 
Eric somehow didn't understand that he himself was a public figure and Howard was well within his rights to have a sex doll made in the image of Eric the actor. This was a very unfortunate situation for Eric, but there simply was nothing he could do. Several people tossed their hats in the ring when it came to auditioning their wieners in the real doll piping party. Gary said he'd gladly resize Eric's hole. Sal, one of the show's many eccentric staff, also said he'd fuck the doll. Richard Christie, another staffer who works very closely with Sal, also wanted to fuck it. Not because he wanted to upset Eric, but rather because he was a sick fuck. Regardless, this doll never ended up getting made and nobody ever had the opportunity to pretend they were creaming the real Eric the Midget. Eric did agree to a possible middle ground. If he were to let Howard make the real doll, he would need some kind of profit from it as well. He wanted to meet Diana DeGarmo, one of the many women that he so desperately wanted to screw. Howard pulled the necessary strings and got Eric in the studio for one appearance. He'd never have another in-person appearance after this, and they needed to make it worth it. He came, did his part for the interview, and allowed a man to get his measurements to make the real doll accurate. Only the guy taking the measurements wasn't actually writing anything down. But he got to meet Diana at the very least, so it was worth it. In other words, Diana, I think what Eric's saying, with time, is there ever a chance you could become Mrs. Eric the Midget? <laughs> well, as of right now, I'm pretty sure my boyfriend wouldn't like that. Ah, that's but... Good luck. Where did you, good where did you meet a boyfriend? <laughs> Oof. Ouch. Maybe this would be a good time to talk about the other women he pined over for so long. It should probably go without saying that Eric had many difficulties with women. He lacked the confidence necessary to court them and had several disadvantages that were out of his control. The Stern Show gave him an opportunity to explore a side of himself he didn't normally get to. Over the course of his calls, he shared details about what women he was attracted to and why. First up was Diana DeGarmo. She was a runner-up in the third season of American Idol, which piqued his interest. She also had a pulse and I'm assuming a functional vagina, so that was even more reason for him to take an interest in her. Eric stalked her social media and even called her mother repeatedly in hopes of getting a hold of her, when somebody stupidly passed her mother's number into Eric's pretzel phalanges. Other women he fancied were Kelly Clarkson and Carrie Underwood, who were both on American Idol. The Stern Show would frequently clown on Eric for his infatuation with Kelly Clarkson, opting to have high-pitched Eric call in and pose as her, despite how different they sounded. Eric thought he was smarter and saw right through the ruse, but he didn't realize that him figuring it out only made it funnier. I'll have to cover high-pitched Eric more extensively in a future video, because his story is just about as big as his gut. Either way, as for Carrie Underwood, in the middle of September 2005, Stern Show staffers played a prank on Eric and convinced him that he was in contact with Carrie, when in actuality he was talking to Anne Marie Palmer, who was working for Stern. In the legendary phone call between Eric and Liquid Carrie, many things were discussed, including the size of his penis. Liquid Carrie told him that his voice was sexy and she was getting all moist for him. She even asked him to moan a bit for her, but he preferred to groan instead. She also asked him several questions, like if he's ever been stepped on in a large crowd, which he denied. She then asked him if he had ever been mistaken for a leprechaun, which of course he totally denied despite the mountain of evidence that he is one. Everyone knows that leprechauns are all wheelchair bound, right? Best of all, she wanted him to pull down his pants and start rubbing his member during the phone conversation, stating, quote, Now take off your diaper and jab me with that shrinky dink. How romantic. Now take off your diaper and jab me with that shrinky dink. I don't wear a diaper. At one point, he had a girlfriend of sorts named Kendra. Kendra was known for showing her body on the internet, as long as people gave her the money that she asked for. A truly liberated woman. Eric was convinced that she was actually in love with him, but surprise surprise, she was just using his fame, or rather his infamy, in order to bolster her own career. Abusing his delicate little heart in the process. She'd frequently bring up her growing business whenever she could, and Eric was somehow none the wiser. Despite her clearly treating him as a stepping stone, Eric defended her honor against Howard to show how much he truly loved her. She allegedly said that she would happily be his girlfriend, but she wasn't in love with him. Love takes time, but Eric was already madly enamored by her from just a few phone conversations. During this whole saga, Howard was offering to use the vast resources at the tip of his bony fingers to find a compatible mate for Eric, someone who wasn't just trying to use him to promote their business on the show. Eric declined this offer, thinking he had found something special with Kendra. She was, however, very hesitant about meeting Eric, despite saying she'd gladly do so. It took plenty of deliberation from Howard and his associates to finally get her to show up. She never put out for him, though, teasing him with the possibility of sexual exploration. And to top it all off, he even covered Wild Thing by the Trogs to profess his deep, undying, passionate love for her. How sweet, right? Anyway, moving along, I've made it clear that Howard called in plenty of favors for Eric. 
Despite how ungrateful and rude our lovable munchkin could be, Howard had a soft spot for him. He'd redeem favors with his friends and business associates to land Eric some work so he could pursue his dream of being an actor. One role he landed thanks to Stern's assistance was for the TV show In Plain Sight. Eric played a minor character, a landlord who couldn't act. Eric, much like many stars before him, had several demands for his presence. He wanted McDonald's provided for him as he needed it. And of course, he needed bottled Pepsi as well, acting as if his tiny role was anything bigger than it was. Furthermore, McDonald's already serves Coke, so why wouldn't he just get Coca-Cola from there? Pepsi and Coke really aren't all that different, you know? He also requested werewolf protection because the filming location was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is home to many werewolves, or at least so he was told. Either way, he was convinced that New Mexico had a lycanthropy problem. His interest in acting naturally transitioned into script writing. Howard had offered to produce a movie written by Eric if he were up to the task. With his eyes full of stars and his heart full of hope, Eric began plagiarizing Charlie's Angels, but he did not even try to put the slightest amount of effort in because he didn't even try to add anything new. The way it was written was nearly identical to the source material, and he was only going to play a very minor off-screen role. This was going to be a problem, as one of Howard's stipulations with his involvement is that Eric would have to play a major part and be on screen. To nobody's surprise, this movie never came to fruition. And not only that, what, you're just going to be sitting on a video phone. That's ridiculous. That's what makes this one different. No, I want you in bed with chicks. I want you to be the main star. I'm not producing this. Look, jackass, that's all you're getting. Eric could not take the beatings, but at the same time, he just could not stay away. One staffer that really burned the actor's ass was Steve Langford. Steve was a reporter for The Stern Show who reported on the happenings of the greater Stern community, lifting trash can lids and peeking through windows of many whack packers. That being said, Eric obviously hated the paparazzi, Steve being no exception. He blamed him for many things that had gone wrong in his little corner of the radio sphere. For example, Eric had a scheduled appearance at a Sacramento WNBA game, a little meet and greet and autograph session of sorts, where Eric was going to meet his many fans and haphazardly scribble his John Hancock into photos of himself. Langford reported that the appearance was cancelled, with absolutely nobody having purchased a single ticket to the appearance, an astonishing 0.0 purchases. After this was announced on the show, roughly 50 fans purchased tickets to meet the legendary wheelchair-bound actor. Langford triumphed over Eric by helping him sell some tickets, but Eric had to be a contrarian and claim that the show was not to be thanked for the ticket sales, because he managed to get them all on his own, somehow. He just had that kind of pull, I guess. Langford did get confirmation about the sales from a few sources, such as Eric's manager, Johnny Frotto. He also had a contact within the Sacramento Monarchs. Speaking of Johnny, he had a web service called the Johnny Fronto Social Club, or JFSC for short. This website hosted a variety of things related to his clients, especially Eric. You see, Eric had been live streaming on this site, essentially pioneering the terrible live content that you consume today. During one of Eric's many JFSC broadcasts, an avid viewer witnessed Eric eating his own boogers. Eric somehow managed to get those curled fingers jammed into his nostrils so he could chow down. Langford reported on this soon after, which Eric was not too happy about. When Johnny heard of this, he stated that he found it disgusting and it was not permissible on his service. This, of course, was a joke. When Langford broke the story, Eric called in and began talking a lot of shit. He even told Langford to go die, which really isn't all that nice. He really lacked a lot of salesmanship. Regardless, Eric continued to talk a big game. He denied every single claim and testimony made against him. But Howard decided to up the ante. He told Eric to swear on his own mother, which Eric did not want to do because that had failed him before. But in actuality, he knew that he was full of shit. Eventually, he caved in and swore on dear old mom, so maybe he was telling the truth. Staffers that had previously met Eric at events came forward and said they also recalled Eric eating his boogers. Things weren't looking too good for his claims. Unfortunately, the truth of his mucus munching has been lost to the ether. Online shows and radio call-ins weren't the only way Eric made a name for himself. He was going to try something a bit more bold than you'd likely expect. The Stern Show was not unfamiliar with stand-up comedy, as Howard had interviewed many comedians and even had Artie Lang as one of his co-hosts for the longest time. Some of the people working for Stern eventually dipped their toes into that business as well, with varying degrees of success. Eric, inspired by the show, attempted to dip the wheels of his chair in, but that might have been a bit much for him to pull off. If Eric really wanted to entertain people, he should have gone along with the balloon saga. Now you might be saying, huh? Balloon saga? Oh yeah, this is one of the prolific events in Eric's story. Howard wanted Eric to do something big for the show, something nobody would see coming, something that could be slightly offensive if you are of a short stature yourself. Howard wanted Eric to be lifted off of the ground via a cluster of balloons. 
The goal was to have Eric be just a few feet off of the ground, with the balloons attached to some kind of seat or harness-like contraption, or maybe directly attached to his wheelchair. One woman tossed her hat in the ring to attempt to convince Eric to fly, saying she would spend some time with him and whatever else that would lead to, if he were to let Howard fly him with balloons. Eric was not easily swayed by the harlot, needing more than just his weasel grease to sweeten the deal. He had many demands made, such as $500,000, $250,000 to the LPA plus an additional $250,000 to an Ellers Danlos charity, a new green Chevy Express van with a rear wheelchair lift, a full year of OnStar, a GPS navigation system, a Sony sound system model CDX GT400 or CDX GT500, a DVD player, and a yellow or gold fabric seat. He also wanted a laptop by either Sony, Alienware, Gateway, Dell, HP, or Toshiba, a Sony DVD camcorder with all of the expected bells and whistles, an Xbox, Xbox 360, GameCube, plus games for them alongside games for his PS2 and PSP, plenty of software for his peripherals and computer that he wants. A specific cartoon that makes fun of him would not be available on Howard TV. Tickets to see Kelly Clarkson with a pass to meet her. Tickets to a meet and greet with Carrie Underwood before her concert, which was two days before Kelly's. He also wanted to meet Diana DeGarmo by August. Howard didn't give in to these bogus requests, stating that Eric would fly without all of his demands being met. He needed the attention more than anything. Eric stated that he would be open to the balloon idea if he could meet Catherine McPhee. Despite Howard's efforts, Eric would backpedal out of every opportunity due to his immense ego and pride. He did measure his penis for a chance to call her on the phone, but that really isn't all that important. Eric ultimately would never fly with balloons, a really anticlimactic ending to such an intriguing prospect. At one point, after being goofed on routinely for years, Eric finally had enough of the show. He swore off calling Howard and his staff for good, and by for good, I mean he only lasted a few days. Problem here is that Eric had a lot of pride in Moxie for his size, but those traits were rivaled by something even more powerful, his unending need for attention. With the goal of talking to his favorite radio host in mind, he formulated a clever plan to get what he wanted without calling. What if someone called for him? Enter Derek from Texas. In order to pull off this audacious feat, Eric was going to need a vessel to plow his way through the phone lines right onto the radio waves. He created an ingenious persona to fool Howard. He assumed the identity of Derek, a man from Texas who definitely isn't Eric. Nope, not at all, not even close. Still not convinced? Derek was from Texas and had a thick accent. Some might argue he even sounded a little sexy. Eric, on the other hand, has a weak little shaky voice, and even if Derek did sound a tiny bit like Eric at times, it was just a coincidence, so don't think about it too hard. His identity was given away when he first spoke, but he tried to stick to the character to no avail. One of the first questions he received was why he was calling, and just like Eric, he hesitated and stated he had problems with Twitter. I wonder who that's like. Hmm. Howard, who was enjoying this pathetic facade, would inquire further about Derek's experiences with Twitter. He mainly just wanted to know Derek's Twitter handle, which Derek claimed was Derek from Texas, but nothing of that nature was found. His main gripe with Twitter was that when he tried to interact with celebrities, a bunch of people would clown on him. Again, I'm just left wondering who that was like. He ultimately returned to the show as normal, but you probably expected that one, right? Eric's feisty demeanor would get him into plenty of arguments online. Stern fans followed Eric around on social media and always gave him a piece of their mind. For example, on March 28, 2014, Eric said the following on Twitter. Weekend time, just ate half a cheese pizza and two hard-boiled eggs while watching Chipwrecked on Blu-ray. So full. The comments that followed his posts were mostly antagonistic, even if they were obviously not meant to be taken seriously. He would still get mad at them regardless. Social media being the wonderful proving grounds that it is, Eric shoved his club foot in his mouth by responding to his detractors any opportunity he got. People goofed on him for watching children's cartoons and movies and whatever adolescent media he'd also consume. After stating he was watching one of the CGI Alvin and the Chipmunks movies, someone tried to needle him by suggesting he was lusting after the Chipettes, the female counterparts to the three main rodents. Eric denied this accusation. I do not lust after the Chipettes, jackass. They're animals, and that's illegal. I like the girls who do voices, but they're real. He also made the foolish decision of sharing that he didn't tip delivery drivers, as he believed they only deserve tips if they're fast. People disagreed, to put it lightly. He said his reasoning for this was because delivery drivers get paid an hourly wage and are reimbursed for travel, totally ignoring the norm of tips. He was just cheap. No, the rule is, if the job takes 30 minutes, you tip. 
pizza people, baristas, bellhops, waiters don't get tips because it's fast work. You don't tip pizza delivery, dumbass. They get paid hourly and they get reimbursed for mileage. Another strange comment from him on the same day was that Friday is actually part of the weekend. I guess weekdays only come in fours, huh? You probably can guess it, but people didn't agree with him yet again. No, Friday is a weekday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, duh. If people choose to work Friday, then that's their problem. Every day is a weekday for you, you stupid little fuckface. Unfortunately, all good stories must come to an end. On September 20th, 2014, Eric was rushed to the hospital because of heart problems, complaining of pain and discomfort. His kidneys and liver began shutting down by the time he was checked in. The news of Eric's passing was shared on September 21st by Johnny, stating, I am so sorry and sad to inform everyone that my friend Eric the actor Lynch passed away yesterday afternoon. Many notable news sites such as the Sacramento Bee, TMZ, The Hollywood Reporter, and others shared the stories of Eric's death. Many people went to social media to share their fond memories of him, and even Diana DeGarmo spoke her piece. Eric's sign-off bye for now was turned into the number one trending hashtag for the day. Eric was a big fan of the Oakland A's baseball team, and they repaid the care by signing off a broadcast by saying bye for now, just like he did. Jan, Eric's roommate and caretaker, shared many happy thoughts about Eric on the show and told fans to eat bacon and drink Pepsi, Eric's favorite foods, in his honor. Eric was buried at Oakmont Memorial Park in Lafayette, California. People often leave cans and bottles of Pepsi at his grave, and I'm sure he'd be thrilled to know that people stopped by to share a drink with him. Eric's story is definitely an unusual one. He was differently abled, sure, but he still had that fire in him. He would talk right back to whoever he felt necessary and did manage to carve himself a nice slice of show business, which is still way more than most of us will ever do. I didn't initially enjoy listening to Eric when I was actively listening to The Stern Show years ago, but after stomaching the slow burn of his tail, I have found that he is one of the best callers the show ever had. And if nothing else, I hope this video encourages you to sit down and listen to some clips of him from the show. He's definitely worth the investment. But that's going to be it for today's video. If you like what I do, leave a comment, rate, and subscribe. If you want to support me in a more personal way, you can check out the Patreon link and the Teespring link in the description. I've got more content coming down the pipeline. But until then, bye for now.